from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The House by the Tarn by Basil Copper. Basil Copper, described as unquestionably one of the greatest living macabre writers, had his best horror stories from the years the to, from the 1960s to the 1970s. Kempt kept on walking. The high shadowed spines of the hills which reared about him emphasized and reinforced the coldness of the winter's day. Hoarfrost silvered the blades of grass which fringed the road. The road itself, its gravel coagulated and bonded by the iron cold of the air, led up between the blunt mounds of the hills, and Kemp followed it, walking easily, his hands thrust deep into the pockets of his thick overcoat, his breath smoking from his nostrils as he ascended. There was a profound silence apart from the faint scraping of his feet in the gravel. There was no traffic on the road and no birds were in the air. The sky was overcast and unfriendly. The intense melancholy of the scene made Kemp realize why most travelers preferred to avoid the turnpike, which had long been superseded by a modern motor road, which looped to the north, avoiding the clasping arms of the remote hills. Once he stopped, as if overcome by the silence and alien starkness of the terrain. On another occasion, the road descended briefly, then rose again, more gently this time, between dark thickets of thorn and scrub, bare and shivering now in the keening wind. A harsh cry from the interior of the bushes startled the man, and seemed to constrict his heart with momentary foreboding. He stood irresolute for a moment, peering nervously about him. Then the sound came again. Kemp's shoulder relaxed. A raven, perhaps? A crow? More fancifully still, a vulture? Kemp's lips curved in a sardonic smile. He turned away and took in the barren curve of the hills. It was not beyond the bounds of possibility with such a missing scene. He resumed his walk, his powerful neck hunched deeper into the warm raglan overcoat, his back turned to protect him from the full force of the wind. It blew in insidious, fitful gusts that had a habit of getting through this guard. The main force was directed across the bald crest of the hills and set up a low, hushed moan. The skirts of the wind, descending into the hollows, rasped unpleasantly among the dried stems of ossified undergrowth and scratched at the grass blades and the frozen masses of soil which held them undulate like a miniature sea. Kemp consulted his watch. He had been walking for an hour. He should reach his destination in a little more than half that now, which would leave ample time for him to retrace his steps in daylight and regain the main road. A long cavalry on such a day to visit the shell of a house, curious enough to cause Goran to put his car at Kemp's disposal. It was typical of Kemp to refuse the offer in a somewhat peremptory manner. That would have spoiled the game for him. Cheating was perhaps too strong a word, but at the very least it would have dissipated the ambience of the occasion, have robbed it of all flavor, and flavor was the essential ingredient of such small adventures. Kemp had left his bag at the end. He would stay the night on his return and continue on his lecture tour through the following days. His schedule would allow him 
two clear days before the next date on the program. And in the meantime, there was the house. His friend Tregoran had set him onto it. Tregoran was his host at the university where he had last lectured, an old friend, gruff, reliable, and dedicated entirely to the higher learning, though not in any narrow way. Their talk over pipes and punch the previous evening had turned as conversation often will of a winter's night on the darker things, of the legends of this gnarled and strangely fashioned countryside, of arcane secrets long handed down by the country folk, and of matters whispered by old people behind closed shutters in the small hours of the winter night. Kemp was fascinated by the more subtle manifestations of legend and mythology, particularly when it impinged on modern life and Tregoran's halting reference to the house had intrigued him from the start. The host knew that his visitor was the author of several small but best-selling volumes on such matters, and he was sure of his ground when he came to broach the subject long after the clock in his study had chimed away midnight. Hence Kemp's sudden resolve, the motor journey with Tregoran the next morning and his refusal of the use of the car. He had been right, he reflected, as he set his face upward again into the bleaker fastness of the hill road. The clouds came lowering down, as though to intimidate the earth. Overhead the bare branches made a heavy lattice which penned in the dark and sullen sky. Kemp was content this was his meteor, the material from which he could fashion the stuff of scholarly, fastidiously worked volumes which would sell steadily over the years. The house had all the aspects of a classic doom which had seized upon his imagination from the beginning. The fact that it was a bare fifty miles from the direct route of his lecture tour and so easy of access during his only two-day stopover could only be regarded as providential. Poe himself could not have improved upon the circumstances. So thought Kemp as he continued to climb, his musings blending with a steady beat of his feet. The story Tregoran had told him, backgrounded by the inhuman cry of the wind, which continued to rise as his measured paces brought him to the higher plateau. The hills were now harsher in outline, their flanks black, like volcanic ash and completely denuded, of vegetation by the scouring gales of the uplands. Despite his ascent towards the source of light, the sky seemed, if anything, to become darker, even though it was the brightest time of day, and twice Kemp paused, fearing somehow that his watch might have stopped. But the homely tick reassured him, and he walked on, a diminutive and lonely figure among the austere irregularities of that lunar landscape could not forget the thin form of Tregorn, his white eyebrows and tired face, lit by the flickering firelight in the study the night before, and the even stranger story he had to tell. The house had been empty for some time, Tregorn said. In fact, more than three decades had passed over its scarred mass, the granite wall still standing, but the slate roof long since fallen, the floors rotted, the windows glassless and the door is demolished by the constant battering of the wind. Four winds with its name, grimly appropriate, Kemp had felt from the Tregoran's description, but he was only now beginning to appreciate the reality. The slamming and buffeting from these wide skies would in time reduce even granite to ground level, he believed. The house had once belonged to a retired silk merchant, who had built it on a scale and in a style he felt to be commensurate with his wealth and dignity, and said Tregoran. But long years in the east had inured him to more temperate climates. The winters unnerved him. He grew melancholy and introspective, and his temper withered in face of the gales which held at the house through long days and nights and months of the dark season. His wife and three children, all girls, were equally fixed in their dislike of the place. Though within all was elegance and warmth, everything that money could buy had been lavished on furnishing and interior. There was crystal and silver and pewter, fine old English furniture ransacked from antique shops, the length and breadth of the land, 
and the collection of 18th century French pictures in the gallery was one of the most envied in private hands. All this, said Tregorn, quoting Poe, was in the olden time long ago, yet despite the outpouring of effort and money, the family did not flourish in their new home. The fabric of the house was subject to mildew, and there was much shaking of heads among the experts hurriedly summoned from long distances. A type of mold, a strange spore which left purple and scarlet lichen, infected the walls in some rooms, yet there was no perceptible trace of damp. The drainage system was painstakingly reviewed and improved by builders, but still the trouble continued, though the cellars had been filled in. The servants complained of the nauseating stench in their quarters, and indeed they had just cause for comment. The owners of the house, descending on one of their rare expeditions, were forced to regain the upper floors with handkerchiefs clapped to their faces. The old kitchen quarters were thereafter boarded up and new rooms assigned for this purpose on the main floor occupied by the family. As if this were not inconvenience enough, there was much illness in the household, though reputable physicians affirm that they could trace no connection between the malady it complained of and the mysterious lichen, which spreads silently and inexorably like a plague through the lower region of the house. A more enlightened young doctor with a scientific turn of mind informally advised the owner of Four Winds to drain the lake which had joined the main building. But the old man was reluctant to do that. It was one of the glories of the place, for the lake was immensely old. According to ancient deeds and maps, it was its superb location on a crest of the hills which had decided the owner on the side of the house. To, conf to confess defeat on a mere point of dampness was an absurdity to one who had once held sway over hundreds of estate workers and body servants in the East. This was the impasse which had been reached when one of the daughters died suddenly and shockingly, said Tregorn. Curiously, it was not the result of the wasting fever which had attacked her father and mother. She had gone out one darkling winter afternoon on a walk round the foreshore of the lake. This had long been Estelle's practice, and as she sometimes spent hours in such pursuits, the family felt no unease at her continued absence. Her father had passed the afternoon reading in a small turret chamber he had constructed out into the lake. The structure projected from the main house and was approached by a passage, and the unfortunate old man often sat there in clear weather, reading and occasionally surveying the dark surface of the tarn with a telescope. And as Tregorm proceeded with his tale, Kemp had felt as though the silk merchant were responsible for creating a latter-day house of Usher in that remote spot. But in reality, the prosaic man had never heard of Poe, and his fancy had run to the wild romanticism of Chillon, which he had once visited on a grand tour of Europe. Hence his penchant for the pseudo-Gothic tower in which he passed so much of his time. On this particular afternoon he had read until he was conscious that the light was beginning to fail. Looking up from his book and training his eye across the lake, he was arrested by something moving in the water. He became aware of a slowly writhing mass of weed floating on the dank surface of the tarn. It came gradually across the field of his vision. Though there was no visible current in the lake, and the merchant presently made out a broken mass of white at the center of the weed. The occasion was so curious as to be a cause for some comment in that placid place, and the old man first called his wife before seeking his telescope from its leather case. So it fell that the wife was the first to put the glass to her eye with some pardonable wonder in the strange phenomena that floated before her. Her horrified shriek and subsequent faint caused a minor crisis in the household. When the servants had carried their mistress from the room, the old man, much agitated at himself, seized the telescope before following the small party down the corridor. What he saw was the drowned face of his daughter. The long hair of Estelle spreading out on the surface of the lake the old man's poor eyesight had mistaken for weed. The staring eyes, open mouth, and mud plastering the dead features had accounted for the broken aspect of the white mass. Kemp had remained cynically aloof, 
as Stragorn had continued his narrative. The former's attitude resembled a mental rubbing of the hands. The blood raced through his veins at a slightly heightened rate. This was distinctly promising, he told himself. But Tregorn's narrative bore all the stamps of a gothic novella, and Kemp himself suspected the tale to be half legend, half embroidery, which the locals had handed down over their intervening years. But he merely stretched himself in his corner by the fire, reached out his hand for the refilled glass of punch his host proffered, and observed, There's more to come, I take it. Tregorn gazed at him grimly perhaps conscious of the slight cynicism in Kemp's eyes. Assuredly, he said crisply. The ever-steepening road wound about in sharp corkscrew curves. Deep groves of pine and birchwood hemmed in the lane, the edges of which were becoming blurred with growths of moss and lichen. The ragged spears of the branches were like sentinels blocking Kemp's escape to right and left, and their darkness emphasized the brooding solitude of the day. His ear was presently caught by the thin, high tinkle of falling water, and turning another shallow curve, he saw the white freshet of a small waterfall, like a scar across the blackness of the landscape, falling freely beyond the trees, then torn by rocks, descending again to view, and finally being engulfed by the dense thickets further down. Curiously enough, his heart was not lightened by the sight. The whiteness of the water was like the pale flabbiness of something long dead, and only emphasized the surrounding desolation. The faint roar of the water strengthened the overpowering sense of loneliness in these far hills, and Kemp was glad when the final fret of the fall at last died away, and his footsteps rang out clear and strong on the gritty surface of the road. He pushed his chin down into the warm collar of his coat as set to musing on Tregorn's story of the unfortunate silk merchant and his family. The drowned daughter had begun a long chapter of dark incidents, ranging from the sickness of the servants to the madness and eventual deaths of other members of the household. Tregorn had certain theories, which he had hinted to Kemp, but out of respect for what he called his visitor's professional ethics, he had refused to clarify his suspicions. The most he would say, heavily enigmatic in the firelight, was that the two men would compare notes after the visit. The silk merchant had died of a wasting fever a short while after the incident described by Tregorn and his wife had followed him within a year. A mass exodus of servants began and the household was eventually reduced to the two surviving daughters a body servant and housekeeper. They lived a miserable existence on an upper story and a priest who visited the family and had befriended them greatly in their troubles described the situation as being like a siege. This old man himself died a violent and unexplainable death when he fell down an iron staircase after one of his nocturnal visits. The authorities hushed up the exact circumstances but one of the remaining servants told the sisters that spores of lichen were clustered about his mouth and eyes. His frenzied efforts to clear his throat and vision were the probable causes of his fall. Within a very few days of this latest tragedy, the survivors and their staff had decamped in the great house was left to decay on through the years, a prey to the buffeting winds of the uplands the dark, ruffled waters of the lake reflecting the somber edifice which had been the scene of so much sorrow. So far as was known, said Tregorin, who had adopted a consciously gothic tone when recounting the story to Kemp, only three visitors had since set foot inside the building. The first had been found dead at the edge of the lake, a prospective purchaser who had walked up like Kemp to absorb atmosphere, as Tregorn put it, his body was huddled in a curious position with strange markings in the mud at the fringe of the lake, which suggested that someone, or something, had attempted to pull him into the water. The second visitor, also a prospective purchaser, was a middle-aged lady. She had driven up one afternoon on a tour of inspection, only to collapse an hour or so later. She had been the victim of a heart attack, 
or at least that was a conclusion reached by a judicial inquiry. The third intruder, for so Kemp had come to describe them in his own mind, was a surveyor sent on behalf of the family estate to assess the condition of the structure. He too had died at the foot of the iron staircase. Since that time, Four Winds had been a shunned house. Legend had it that the three who died had been the only people to set foot inside the house proper, though Kemp found that difficult to believe. There must have been policemen, officials, and others concerned in the investigations, but he found the stories intriguing. Nowadays, Tregorn said local people would view the house only from a distance across the valley from the nearest road, and then they would hurry on, leaving the broken shell to its solitary vigil. It stood up like a jagged tooth against a great promontory of woodland with a lake hidden beneath the mass of trees. A secondary road, looping round from the old turnpike, would take the visitor to its door. And so it was that at last Kemp came out from the fringe of the far woods and saw the side road below him. He descended a spiral path that debouched from the main turnpike and found himself on a rutted, unmade road, which he knew led eventually to four winds. The sky was strangely dark, and to his surprise, he had not yet seen the house. But as he set foot on the moss-strewn pathway, he became suddenly to a break in the trees, and there was a great mass of granite, barely distinguishable against the far slopes, its frameless, glassless windows, like blank sockets in the structure. He barely paused in his pacing. The glimpse he had obtained had been so much of an anticlimax. The bows pressed in on him like a long tunnel, and his feet in the moss made furtive, sucking noises. Kemp guessed that some freshet debouching into the lake passed underground at this point, making the ground spongy and swamp-like. Sure enough, as he turned on his tracks, his solitary shoe marks in the lichen were silently filling with water. The silvery sheen looked like metal in the dim light which filtered through the branches. After another three or four minutes, the trees dropped away, and he found himself on a wild and desolate shore. It was sheltered here, and only an occasional swirl of wind touched the calm and limpid waters of the tarn, so that it looked to him as though subterranean disturbances were causing the surface to erupt. The place smelt bad. Kemp, with his long experience of such things, knew that he was looking at a landscape filled with infinite evil. Nearer the lake edge, foul, scummy bubbles burst in the thickets of sedge, which caked the shore like the poison round an abscess. The shadows of the trees wrote themselves again in the sullen waters of the lake. Yet despite himself, Kemp was secretly exalted. Melancholy house of Usher, he said out loud. The words seemed to hang motionless on the freezing air before slowly dying away in tiny vibrations. Kemp looked down. In the black water at his feet, weeds swirled and twined quietly where there was no current. A pale sphere broke the surface. He found himself looking at a girl's drowned face. His smothered cry was followed by a cracking sound. As he involuntarily started back, his heel had caught a dead branch, snapping it. White-faced Kemp forced himself to look down at the water. Of course, there was nothing there. What he had mistaken for hair was indeed weed, and where the pale oval face had been was nothing but the reflection of a portion of sky, framed between entwining branches in the thicket of his back. Kemp passed on, his ragged nerves fretting. Tregorn had done his work too well, he felt ruefully. The legends and stories with which he had kept his guest entertained the previous night had penetrated deep. Even now he could not disentangle fact from embellishment. And yet he could not really imagine that his host would depart from the strict letter of the truth. He had known him far too long to be mistaken in such an important aspect. Incredible to suppose for one moment that Tregorn had been playing an elaborate joke on him, if it were so a friendship of many years would be in the balance. Kemp dismissed the supposition from his mind without a tremor, 
The atmosphere for winds and particularly the lake for shore should have been enough to satisfy him that here was no imaginative daydreaming on the part of a fanciful servant. On the contrary, any normal person would have retraced his passage without a moment's hesitation, thought Kemp with a suspicion of a wry smile. His mind was alert now, its receptivity attuned to any manifestations that the place might be giving off. The professional attitude of the experienced investigator was taking over the primal fears of his unconscious. From now on and throughout the visit, he would be on guard, a scientific observer merely, weighing dispassionately and putting all data on the scales of logic. Easy enough to say, thought Kemp, looking round him, hard enough to achieve under these conditions. He skirted the lake and came closer to the house. Its granite mass crouched under the dark sky and the darker trees like something waiting to engulf him. He walked towards it reluctantly with heavy steps, as though wary of the first contact. His way took him past a great old tree with withered limbs that framed four winds like a crannic engraving. A path wound here and passed round and beneath the massive spread of branches. The faint echo of the wind plucked at the skirts of the thicket and Kemp paused, as though a chill engendered not only the physical conditions of the day had entered into him. Then, he knew not why, he turned and circled the gnarled trunk of the tree on the landward side. As he did so, the wind blew again out of the freezing sky. There was a crack and an impact that shuddered the soft earth on which Kemp stood. He continued his walk around the tree and looked behind him. A branch that overhung the path, its mass larger than a man's body and its weight enough to dash the life from anything beneath had fallen. The force of the shock had shattered the immense bow to fragments its impact bearing the main shaft several inches into the ground. Kemp stood very still. He smiled at the house, baring his teeth under the dark sky. He knew he must look foolish, but it was essential to show that he was not afraid. Backwards he could not go. The house was watching him, and it was essential at all times to see what it was doing. He felt no fear now, only that he must go on and become a personal thing, something between him and the house, a contest that could only be resolved in one of two ways. And to bring it to a successful conclusion, Kemp knew that he must not reveal, even by so much as a fraction, that he was conscious of the force of the naked fear that gibbered in that freezing air beneath that low sky. He studied four winds for a moment, under half-closed lids, the great Palladian porch, only one pillar upright now, the roof quite gone, the floors, as Tregorn had said, completely fallen in. All that was left was the jagged shell, open to the wide, inhuman sky. Kemp marveled at the stubbornness which had kept the silk merchant and his family here, perhaps kept them still. He skirted the frontage of the house cautiously, there was not a door remaining, not a window to be seen. The wind keened uneasily through the structure, probing with expert fingers for any hidden flaws, the air ruffling the long fronds of fern and weeds that grew in dirt-grimed cracks, like the hands of a lover passing through the beloved's hair. Kemp knew he had to be careful now. He had been given two warnings. Traditionally, the third might be the last. He did not intend to be taken by surprise. He passed to the end of the building, stopped abruptly. A turret jetted out into the lake, its glassless windows showing vistas of the waters beyond. He remembered Tregorn's story of the old man's vigil and wondered again about that tragic scene of long ago. The house was challenging him to beat it and to break the spell the dark stories had woven for the country people. He had to venture within and emerge unscathed. He remained irresolute for a moment or too longer. Then he retraced his steps and found himself again 
on what had once been a wide gravel forecourt facing the lake. He passed up a shallow flight of grass-grown steps and into the ruins of the porch within the floorless walls. Four winds stared ruthlessly to the pitiless sky. The wind sowed about the shattered pediments and through the glassless window sockets. Not a bird sang. No scutter of any living creature broke the deadness of the scene. Then Kemp saw the steps. They were jagged, ruined, little more than a thin line of slabs led into the wall at one side of the main structure, but they led upwards and unmistakably towards the turret room. Kemp knew that the house was daring him, knew equally well that if he hesitated, he could not face it. He pushed up the steps, his feet uncertain on the slimy paving, gained what had once been the first story the view downwards was like looking into an awful pit. Through the gaping window holes in front the darkness of the lake sat and watched him. There was a curious stench as he ascended to the second floor. The steps were firm and solid. There was no danger here, but he now saw that the wall at his left hand was pitted and scarred. Looking closer he noticed minute spores striated lichens and strangely colored polyps which hung limpet like to the old granite the stench came from these kemp gasped involuntarily as the wall as he stumbled something broke away in his hand and he nearly fell he held a flabby object shaped like a human finger and of pallid and unhealthy hue the fungus seemed to pulse in his hand as he stared at it Little spores emanated from it and flew in clouds round Kemp's head. The smell was really awful. Kemp's head was reeling and his eyes smarted. He gave a muffled cry and slipped again. He hurled the fungi thing from him with a hoarse shout of terror. His vision cleared and he scrambled and lurched up the last remaining flights to the turret room, his heart thumping uncontrollably, his nerves screaming. There was no floor in the turret room, only a continuation of the rough slab stone which formed the staircase. Kemp stood at an open revment in the wall and wiped his face with his handkerchief. There was a palsy tremor in his limbs. A few gray spores flew about his head as though they had volition of their own as he passed a handkerchief across his forehead. He stayed crouched there for several minutes until his racing heart had steadied and his nerves were back to normal. He coughed as though the commonplace sound confirmed his triumph, for it had been a definite victory, Kemp felt, in his confrontation with what he considered to be the evil spirit of the house. The third sign had been overcome without anything more unpleasant happening to him than a nasty fright. He gazed down into the floorless well of the house and willed his nerves into normality. After all, there had to be an occasion when the power of the house was confronted with the equally remorseless will of a professional occultist. Though he knew the house was not done with him, Kemp felt he was several points to the good. Four winds squatted there and waited. It had him in its maw, but the third warning had been given and overcome and still Kemp survive, like Jonah in the belly of the whale. He put back the handkerchief in his pocket, straightened his tie, and reached for his notebook. It was only then that he noticed the gap in the staircase. About ten feet further down over the stone across which Kemp had just advanced, there was now a space of about fifteen feet which barred him from the lower part of the house. Kemp stared for a moment. It was a nasty shock. The house's trump card, so to speak. Paradoxically, Kemp felt his spirits rising. He was equal to the challenge. Kemp laughed. The sound rang round the old shell with the impact of a bell peeling in the airless confines of a vault. Let the house do its worst, the gesture seemed to say. The human spirit was unbreakable. As the last echo died away, Kemp stood poised, his hand braced against the damp stone, his ears straining for a sign. Would the house accept defeat? Eons seemed to pass, 
Kemp stood by the wall. During the volley motion, he had an unshakable conviction that he had won. At last, the house had been defeated. It was growing dark, but even with a gap in the staircase, knew, Kemp knew he could regain the ground floor safely. Still, he lingered. His mind filled with age-old dreams. The lake lapped below. The wind murmured coldly through the granite cage of the ruined building, and his triumph soared, reflected in the smile in his eyes. And the sign came. Down below, a door slammed where there was no door, and heavy footsteps, echoing where there was no floor, advanced towards him.